Good morning, everyone. The sun is up. And so let's just enjoy the presence of God this morning. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let us stand. Our Father, we thank you for how you have been good to us this week. Thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, for your faithfulness, for your healing, for your provision. We thank you enough, Lord Jesus. For we have loved us, Lord Jesus, that you are our everything, the most special. How you have saved us, how you have written, Lord, our names in the book of life. Because you love us so much. And we are forever grateful for you. Because you have freed us, Lord Jesus, from the law of sin, Satan, and even self. Indeed, our chains are God. Let's thank the Lord as we sing that truth this morning. Our chains are gone. My chains are gone. Free. Been set free. My God, my Savior, has rescued me. And like a flower, His mercy. And then
we are here this morning and you would like to count the cost of following me. It's not just 50%, 70%, we require 100%. But we know that it's hard. But we thank you that just as you have saved us by your grace, living the Christian life is also by the grace of God. So this morning as we lift our eyes to you, as we lift our hands, surrendering the Lord to you, Jesus is worthy of our praise, of our worship, and adoration. We commit our lives to you. We dedicate our lives to you. We surrender.
you give up your work and ministry. Let's give joyfully as we come forward and give our hands and insights and our offerings.
in me. Have your way in your church. Because you are the Lord. You are the King. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are seated on your throne. You are greater, and stronger, and larger than any cares and concerns that we have. Probably some of you here are worried about something. We're struggling about something. But you cannot concentrate. Seeing the hand of God, seeing His grace, His mercy, His love. Our prayer is now. Lord, overwhelm us by your love. Every time, it's time we see that we are on fire for Jesus. Every time we see that we continue, that we keep on keeping on. That can only happen when we are overwhelmed by your love. Because that kind of love is shown perfectly at the cross. You did not give up on us. And so this morning, I pray for all of us that we will be able to understand and be able to see that great love you have for us. That no matter what we go, we go through in this life, and even in our present situation this morning, you love us. Your love never changes. You love us this way. So we hold on to your promises this morning. We put our trust in you. We put our hope in you. Wherever you lead us, we will find you. If you tell us to go ahead and we go ahead, turn to the right and we turn to the right, turn to the left and we turn to the left, and you say stop, we stop. Teach us all to be committed to you because you are worth the following. So this morning, I pray that as, as we sit at the feet of Jesus, like Mary did, that we will hear your voice, that we will hear what you would like to say to us personally and as a church. Holy Spirit, speak to us. We bless you. We welcome your work in our midst this morning. Bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. God is with us. Amen. 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 Before we see it, why don't we welcome everyone around us? It's been a long while since you have really welcomed them. Why don't we just say hello and hi to everyone? Thank you. Please be seated and again welcome to our worship service. So before I call on our speaker, I just want to give a few announcements. It's December time. So we know when it's December, it's uh, the holidays, Christmas is coming. So just a reminder, if you have old clothes, maybe this coming Christmas you have new gifts and you have new clothes to wear. If you have old clothes, we are collecting old clothes to give to our other churches that we are sponsoring, especially in Budapandan. So those old clothes you can, or old toys or shoes, you can give them at uh, our church office at Lakson. Or you can also bring it here. Please specify uh, 
who they're for, okay? They're for giving to the Philippine God, or maybe you have people to give to, please write them on the box or the, on the plastic that you'll be giving. Also, uh, this December 16, we will be having our Youth Thanksgiving Christmas, Christmas Fellowship. Youth Thanksgiving Christmas Fellowship, December 16, that will be next Saturday, 5.30, at our church, BTCC Laxon, uh, it will be at the auditorium. So please, if you have kids who are ages 10 to 20 years old, you're invited to go. Please confirm with your small group leaders if you are in a small group. Uh, also, just a reminder, this Sunday, next Sunday will be December 14. After that, December 24, we will be having a joint Christmas worship service at our Laxon Main Church, okay? So, no one will be here. Please don't come here on December 24. We will be having our church service at 9.30. 9.30, okay? Please be there on time or earlier. I think uh, the parking will be a bit limited. So, if you can do uh, help one another and let's have a uh, carpool, it will be better. But if you want to be there earlier, uh, you are most welcome, okay? And that evening, we will be having a Christmas celebration as well. This time, uh, we will do it at 5.30 p.m. So after the Christmas celebration, Christmas Eve celebration, we can still go home and have our uh, Christmas dinner with the families. Uh, we will be reminding you, uh, for the 24th morning, we will be having our Christmas uh, special Christmas offering. Okay, so pray about it. If the Lord is touching you to give more, you are most welcome. And that night, on the 24th uh, Eve, we will be having a special offering we call Packs of Love. Uh, previously, before the pandemic, we collect the Packs of Love, but we call it Boxes of Love. Then we prepare the boxes, and we always give them to the provincial hospital and sometimes to the Silai Hospital uh, during Chinese New Year. But since the pandemic started, we, we can't go. We can't go into any hospital. So we've been giving them to our outreach pastors or even some who were damaged during some of the uh, typhoons or earthquakes. So we give them the boxes. Or we call them packs right now. So if you have, uh, again, if the Lord touching you to give, right now we're preparing. One pack is around 600 pesos. So pray about it. We are targeting around 200 packs. Uh, we still don't have any target people, but we want to be ready to give. Okay, so if again the Lord is touching you, please give. And also just a reminder, our missions, uh, uh, missions fund, we are still around, uh, we have a reach our target for around 500,000. So again, the Lord is calling you to give, you are most welcome to give. Our missions month usually starts September. So it will end next year, August again. So any amount that we give will be connected as our missions uh, fund. Also, lastly, uh, please join us again. And this coming Wednesday will be our prayer and fasting. So we are here every second Wednesday at 6 p.m. will be our prayer and fasting. Everyone is welcome to join us. So right now, let's prepare our hearts and listen to our to the word. We welcome Pastor Dave. Morning. Good morning. Uh, it's been a while since I've been here because uh, a lot of things happened and um, with my schedule I've been busy. But I thank the Lord that uh, before the end, the year end, uh, I can I can um, come and worship with you again. So um, can I wait? How many of you are excited for 2024? Can you see your hand? How many of you felt uh, 2023 was very challenging? Or very exciting? Very exciting. So which, which do you feel? Is it challenging or exciting? exciting? How many percent challenging? How many percent exciting? exciting? Exciting. Well, for me, 2023 is both 
challenging and exciting. A lot of things happened, and um, the Lord's faithfulness and graciousness is evident in the midst of all the challenges that we're facing. So I know that uh, life is challenging. We don't know what is ahead for 2024, but uh, we continue to believe in the faithfulness of the Lord as He's able to deliver us from whatever problems that happens in our life. I believe that the many of you have prayed for me during the accident that I had last um, uh, August, and I thank the Lord for His hand that is at work. So um, God has been good that um, we were able to connect with the family and um, we will be visiting them before the end of the year in their place in order to have fellowship and bless them. So the Lord opened door of connection in order for sometimes in the midst of tragedy and prop or opens in order to do the work that he wants to do which normally cannot be fulfilled in normal ways. Um, I would like to focus on um, Isaiah chapter 60 and move us to another passage this morning. But uh, Isaiah 60 verses 1 to 3 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and taste to the brightness of your dawn. I believe that this month, we're talking about how we can shine for Jesus. And before we shine for Jesus, we recognize that we are the light of the world because Jesus is the light. And so as we look at our life, we kind of see ourselves as not just simply reflecting the glory of God, but we understand that the glory of God is shining through us because the Holy Spirit is in us. And that's why in Isaiah 60, it's it tells us, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. It rises upon you, within you. This verse was given to us last year as we were praying for the city. And that's why in the midst of the challenging uh, Christmas celebration last year, we called it Arise, because we believe that um, God is placing this verse um, as, a, as a word for what he's going to do in the midst of our city. We believe that more prayers and intercession is needed uh, as the Lord continues to open door for our city. So let me share with you just a few things so that you can pray with us. We believe you have been praying for this city and for the work that is going on. And we also thank you for your prayers for the Hope Center. Construction for the Hope Center has not yet started because of the papers. However, the good news is we were able to complete as a, a much simpler structure as we wait for the title to be finished so that we can start the construction of the retreat center. So this simpler structure is called the colonnade. It's a place just for people to be able to gather together around. So it could um, gather around 50 people. It's an open area. And on the second, on the basement, are six prayer rooms that people can go and spend time with the Lord in prayer. So if you have a small group and you want to just gather there and have time to, to do a retreat and prayer, feel free to let us know. Because um, it's our desire that uh, this place will be a place for, for people to seek the Lord and to really spend time in prayer. So these are the rooms below are not uh, for sleeping, they are for praying. So it can hold two people at a time as they pray and seek the Lord. So we call it the colony because uh, it's located in, in a little middle cliff area. So that's why we decided to have a basement, which will be the prayer room. So we also thank you for your prayers because uh, our pastor's fellowship, we have celebrated its 25th anniversary last September. And um, it was an opportunity for us to strengthen the fellowship of the pastor. And so God has been opening door for us to be able to minister to different um, uh, government-related agencies. So opportunity to, to minister and do Bible study in BJMP has been open. 
as well as Balai Silangan. What is Balai Silangan? It is a one-month rehabilitation for those who are into drugs but are under probation. So in other words, nadakpan sila um, in a priso but pwede, pwede mag-bargain kan mag-probation. So instead, they are referred to Balai Silangan where they are housed for one month. So the government has to spend big budget for this because the people there um, are, are given accommodation, given food to eat. So for one month, um, they are taught about uh, the danger of drugs, so on and so forth. Uh, they go through psychological um, counseling and testing. And at the same time, spiritual formation is also given to them. So we praise God that um, we have um, facilitated three batches, two men and one women batch for the Balai Sedangan. And we have also done two retreats after they have completed their one month um, rehabilitation. Um, they are not required, but they, many of them came to join the overnight retreat for both the men and the women. A few weeks ago, we also had the opportunity to do spiritual formation for the parolis of um, Bacolod City under DOJ. And we thank, we thank God for, a lot, for Chambers for allowing us to use the fourth floor. So there are around 700 or more parolis in Bacolod City. There are people who are under parole. So this is, but this is group number two which comprises of more than 200 uh, parole, parolees of people having committed crime like drugs, rape, murder and so they have to check in every month, twice a month to do community service and at the same time to be educated again in drugs or uh, to have spiritual formation. So, the head of uh, the parole program uh, asked us to facilitate again the spiritual side. So we thank the Lord for these open doors that God is doing in our midst. And so with these things, we try to gather them together in order to have one track or one direction. And so through the peace and order um, of Bacolo City under one of our counselors, uh, I'll say, we try to gather the DOJ, the Balai Silangan program, and other related um, other related groups that are part of the peace and order uh, program of our city. So let's continue to pray because we believe that the city can progress in business, uh, in infrastructure, but these are just the external progress. But underneath, is the peace and order that is vital. Crime will continue on as a city progress. In fact, many times as a city prosper, it attracts more criminals. But if we are able to go underneath and deal with the uh, with, uh, crime by, by having the opportunity to lead them to Christ, then this our prayer, the transformation in the city will truly happen. We are also working um, with, um, with getting the, the family life parenting training program into the barangay. And so an executive order has been made in order to facilitate bringing the training program of uh, family life, which is called P-Force. It is not for police, but P-Force. It talks about strengthening the parenting program in the home so that um, as as the parents learn how to be, how to raise up their children, we will have lesser children growing up with issues and baggages. We believe that most of the problems that we have in society today, crime, drug addiction, um, identity or gender problem, uh, delinquent, delinquent problem, delinquency or whatever, you know, all this problem is rooted in the home. So if the home is not addressed, the couples and the parents are not addressed, then we will not be able to solve all this problem. Okay? And then recently we had a meeting with that as well, in which they are 
looking for people who are able to help them in um, helping the student because of the double suicide among some of the schools. They identified five public schools with high rate suicide. And so they need help in how to reach out, how to counsel, and how to how to help and minister to the student in the public school. So we're praying to, to launch a pilot project in one of the local public school and hopefully it will become a model project that can be adopted and used in other public school as well. So throughout the year, we will have a simple Christmas celebration. This will be on December 21, Thursday at 4.30. Why 4.30? Because we have been doing a lot of uh, big celebration for the Christian community. But one of our targets is to be able to reach out to those who are working in the government center. So this is open even to churches, but our goal here is to have the opportunity to pray, to minister, and even to do counseling with those who are working in the government center. We are praying in preparation for next year that an executive order can be written to allow um, 15 minutes at least a week of inspirational talk and prayer to each and every offices and department in the government center. So let's pray that this will be materialized because um, you know, 15 minutes is 15 minutes. It's not that long. But if hunger can be stirred up among the people, then they will ask for more. So let's pray as um, the Lord is helping us organize and put things into um, into proper planning. So today we'd like to focus more on the name of Jesus. The name that was given to him, that was prophesied. I believe that the name of Jesus um, for, for, for many for many as controversy because what should be the name that should be used to, uh, to refer to Jesus? So there are some people who dogmatically say it has to be Yeshua because Jesus is derived from the pagan, pagan background. But I believe that the name of Jesus is powerful not because of the name, but because of the person behind the name. In fact, Jesus himself said that the day will come that there will be people who will be calling my name. There will be people who will be calling me Lord. But I tell you the truth, I do not know them. So it's not the name, but it's the person behind the name that makes the name powerful and important. So some people call Jesus, Jesus. Some people call him Yaso. Some people call him Yeshua. Some people call him Yesu. Some people call him Jesus. It's the name, it's the person behind the name that matter. You know, just recently, I came across a, a person who was sharing that it has to be Yeshua. Because if you don't use Yeshua, then you're, you're referring to somebody else. You know, I believe that um, Yeshua comes from the Hebrew word, which is uh, God says, and it is translated in our Bible as Joshua. So Joshua is Yeshua in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, um, that name was carried over. However, being in the Arabic and Greek um, language, the word that was used in Greek is Yesu. So that's why if you look at the Bible, the, the word Henry, so on and so forth, is Yesu that was being used. So yes, we can make a big deal out of a name, but in the end, what really matters is do we know the person behind the name. One time, uh, some of the, in the Bible, in the book of Acts, there were sons of a high priest named Simba who was trying to cast out demons and they said in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches we command you to leave and what was the response of the demons? 
They said, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who are you? They can use the name of Jesus, but there was no power because they don't know and acknowledge the, the, the person behind the name. So it's our relationship with Jesus Christ that truly really matters. In fact, one name alone is not enough to describe who he is. In the Bible, we know that the name of God is transliterated in four consonants. Y-H-W-H. Why is it in consonant? Because the original Hebrew Bible do not have vowels. Have you ever tried reading a book without vowels? There is no A, E, O, U. But how can the Jew read their Bible or scripture without vowels? Because they full-heartedly followed what Deuteronomy said. Read the word of God to your children when they rise up, when they go to sleep, when they leave the house, when they come home. And so they were reading it even to the point that even the uneducated people in Israel knows how to read the scripture. But the problem is, every time they come across the name of God, they have to replace it with Elohim. Because the name of God for them is so sacred. And they don't want to misuse the name of God. So ultimately, we lost the real way of reading YHWH. So today there are two versions. Either you read it as Yahweh by putting an A and E in between, or you read it as Yehovah by putting three vowels in between. Yahweh, Yehovah, it's, we know whom it refers to. It refers to the God who says, I am who I am. And even then, God has to continue to reveal himself. That's why we know God as Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Sintinu. All this refers to an important aspect of God that we need to know. When we come to Jesus Christ, Jesus is not the only name of Jesus. One of the names given to Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. The prophecy reminds us that one day the Messiah will come and when he comes, God literally will walk on this earth with man. That's why Emmanuel, God with us. And when we come to Isaiah chapter 9, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So Jesus, or Yeshua, is not the only name given to the Son of God. There are names given to Him. But we know who the Messiah is. We know who Jesus is. Just background, Isaiah chapter 9 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Because during the time, Israel um, was in danger of being destroyed and Judah was also following the footsteps of Israel in living wicked lives. And God has been warning them against the judgment that will come. But one thing that is good about God is that in the midst of proclaiming judgment, He continued to, to give promises of restoration. When you read all the prophetic book, you are going to see that many times, God's anger and righteousness is aroused because of the wickedness of men. And He will proclaim judgment upon Israel. Swarms of locusts will come upon you. Armies will come and attack you. But you will never fail to see one thing. In the midst of all this, the Lord will always promise restoration. A day will come when I will do this. The time will come when this will happen. And Isaiah is full of that promise of restoration in the person of the Messiah. That's why the people walking in darkness, it will be a time of great darkness where crime, where wickedness, where murder is, is, is all around. But the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And when we jump to um, verse 6, it says, 
For to us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I, I say that, emphasize on that part, the zeal of the Lord Almighty, the passion, the determination of God will cause this to happen. We know that this is not an easy promise because it will require God to send His one and only Son to die in this world for the sins of mankind. It will require a great sacrifice. But the, the determination of the Lord to see this happen is evident when I say that said, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. When we went to Israel, we were able to visit the place of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ at Tokoata. And I was reminded that um, God commanded Abraham to go to the, to the high place. It is believed that the, the very place where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac is the same place where Jesus was crucified. There during the time of Abraham, God told Abraham, go take your son, the son whom your, your only son whom you love, and offer him to me. It is a reflection and a reminder to us of what God said. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. And just before Abraham was about to strike Isaac, the angel of the Lord stopped him and directed him toward a ram in, that is given in place of Isaac. When we look at the Bible, God has already planned everything in advance. The promise of the Messiah, the coming of the, of the Christ, is found all the way in the book of Genesis. Even in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when God promised that from the seed of a woman will come one who will crush the head of the serpent. In Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 5, it says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. What is a stump? A stump is the remain of a tree that has been cut down. And normally when you look at a stump, it, is, it seems lifeless, dying or drying up. But the promise of the Bible is a shoot will come up from that stump. And from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. God was referring to Israel. Even though Israel has been cut off, but God's plan for Israel is not over. In fact, the promise of the Lord is that the throne of David will last forever and ever. How can that promise happen? That there should always be somebody from the line of David who will be sitting on the throne. But when Israel was conquered by Babylon, Israel ceased to be a kingdom and a nation. But yet, though there is no physical throne on earth, there is a throne that continues to exist in the heavenlies. And that throne was seated by Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of God. And because He is a perpetual King who is eternal and who has no term, because He is, he is forever, then the throne is forever. That's the promise of the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and of might. The Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Today what we need as believers is the fear of the Lord. If I were to ask how many of us love God, 
Are we confident in raising our hand? Yeah. In our hearts, we know we love God, correct? But we struggle sometimes in following Him. You know, because we know that loving God means being ready to give everything to Him, to follow Him, to obey Him. But there is a struggle, yet in our heart we know we love Him. One time, John DeVere wrote a book wherein he, expre- he, he narrated uh, his visit and interview with a former famous evangelist and gym maker who was in prison because of uh, some of the controversy and issues that happened. And Jack Demir asked him, um, what happened? Isn't it that you love God? If you love God, then how can this happen? How can, how can you end up in prison? Well, Jim Baker explained, being in prison is the grace of God. Because if I was not, if, if, I, if, I, if I did not end up in prison, then probably I might have lost my salvation. But he said, I realize it's not, it's not a question whether I love God or not. Because I love Him. But what I realized that I lost was the fear of the Lord. One aspect of loving God is fearing Him. And in this generation where people talk about love all the time, they have forgotten that other aspect, the fear of the Lord. It is not the love for the Lord that will cause you to turn away from your sin. It is the fear of the Lord that will cause you to turn away from your sin. And when we say fear of the Lord, it is not fear that you are afraid, you run away, you hide just like Adam, but it is a fear that draws us to Him. It is a healthy fear that causes us to recognize Him as somebody close to us because he is our father, he is our friend, yet at the same time we recognize that he is God Almighty. And we need to give him the reverence that he deserves. That's why one time when God was speaking, the people of Israel heard the sound and they were terrified and they told Moses, Moses, you go and talk to God and tell us what, he, what He's telling you. But don't let Him talk to us or we will die. And what did Moses says? Moses said, do not be afraid. But the Lord has come so that the fear of the Lord will be upon you and will keep you from sinning. The very interesting, Moses said, do not be afraid. And then he said, The fear of the Lord has come upon you. Moses was separating two kinds of fear. The earthly human fear versus the godly fear. God wants us to be free from the earthly and fleshly fear. But He desires that we have that fear of the Lord in our heart. Because that's what will keep us living our Christian life. And the Bible continues to say, he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. Many times we make the wrong judgment, we make the wrong choices or decision because we base our judgment on what we see and what we hear. We are biased in our perspective. But the Bible says the Messiah will judge not by what he sees or what he hears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decision for the poor of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. So this is the description of the Messiah. So briefly, I would like to share with you the four names that we mentioned a while ago. First, 
wonderful counselor. Why do we need a wonderful counselor? Why does this word mean a counselor? You know, the word wonderful comes from the um, from the Hebrew word "ele," which is miracle, wonder, extraordinary, incomprehensible. And of course, the word counselor from the S, which means to advise or to give counsel. Wonderful counselor gives us a picture of a guidance that you need. And when you hear that guidance, it's like you begin to scratch your head and say, why have I not thought about it? And the answer is very simple. Because it is beyond you. That's why it is wonderful. And that's the promise of the Lord. That He will be our counselor. Proverbs 15, 22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel. But when with many advisors, they succeed. And Proverbs 19, 21 says, Many are the plans in the person's heart. But it is the Lord's purpose that will prevail. There are five reasons. There are five factors influencing our decision making. That's why we need a counselor. What are these factors? First, our upbringing. Family, environment, our upbringing influences the decision we make. You know, sometimes we think that um, we are able to make decisions on our own, but if we look deeper, many times we are influenced by what we are used to when we were growing up. I will minister to a youth whose one of the main problems is borrowing money. Dolaan siya na makulang, dasig na makulang. Even if it is not essential, makulang siya. But guess what? One of the things that he hated and disliked in his parents is also the same. Now sometimes a person will grow up and say, you know, when I when I become a, a dad or a mom, when I become a dog, you know, I will not do what my parents do. But sometimes they end up doing it nonetheless. You know, our upbringing, if we if we don't come to the Lord and allow the Lord to change us and to heal us, we will influence the decisions that we make in life. The second is experience. We go through life with many experiences, painful and pleasurable experience. And many times when we are about to make decisions and there are triggers that remind us of our pain or the pleasure that we made that we had before, then we navigate towards those directions. For example, you are about to you are about to close a deal and then all of a sudden something triggers you and reminds you of the betrayal that you experienced in the past. And it caused you to move away from whatever transaction or deal that you are going to have. Third is social inf social influence, peers and media. Do you agree that media influence today is stronger than peer pressure? In fact, I realize that many Christians today get what they know from social media. Their theology, their doctrine is derived from social media rather than from the scripture. And so we have to be careful. It's good to listen to preaching, podcasts, and social media. But let it not be an alternative or a replacement to the word of God. Number four, sentiment memory or something that we are drawn to or attached to. There are things in life that is sentimental to us and it also influences our decision making. And the fifth is emotion. Excitement, fear, and anger. I believe that we heard we, we heard that this advice that we should not make any decision in the height of our emotion. When you are so angry, that's not the right time to make decision. When you're so down, 
does not have the right time to make a decision. Decisions should not be made in the height of emotion, but decisions should be made when we are sound in mind. Because our emotion can influence the decisions that we make. So that's why we need a counselor. And this is the wonderful thing. Jesus promised a counselor that will be with us forever. In fact, the Holy Spirit, the, the word that is translated as counselor is from the Greek word that, that means paraclete. It means somebody coming alongside you. It, does, it doesn't simply talk about somebody coming to you to give you an advice and then leave you on your own. But it gives us a picture of somebody not only giving you advice, giving you counsel what you need to do, but is with you as you are doing the advice and the guidance that was given to you. So it's like Jesus promised us, this is what you need to do. And as you start to do it, He is there with you as you are doing it. That's the picture that is being given to us. We have a counselor who don't just give advice. We have a counselor who journey together with us in our life and in our ups and down. The second name is Mighty God. The word mighty from the Hebrew word before means strength, power, and warrior. And of course, God is hell. So it could be translated as God of strength, God of power, or God of warrior. It gives us a picture of a conqueror who is always victorious in battle. This reminds us that we have a God who is victorious. And as his children, he has promised us that we will be more than conquerors through him. So what should be our response to mighty God, mighty God? First, we need to trust him. If he is mighty, all-powerful, all-capable, then we should trust him. We should love him. Because he loved us. He gave his life for us. And of course, third, we have to serve him. Serve him with all our heart. The third name is Everlasting Father. Now this name is a bit challenging for many of us who come from a Trinitarian perspective because we have this mindset that God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the Father, God, we know. The Messiah, we know Him to be the Son. And of course, the Holy Spirit, the third person. Now, the Son is being called Everlasting Father. How does it work? Okay? Now, during the time of Isaiah, the idea of the Trinity was not there. Throughout the Old Testament, God has been emphasizing His oneness. What does it mean? It means that He is not only telling the Israelite that there is only one God and no other, but He was telling the Israelite, Here, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So much so that when He begins to reveal Himself in three person, the Israelite will still remember there is only one God, not three. So we are Trinity Church. Obviously, we believe in Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe not in three gods. We believe in one God, in three persons. Okay? Does it make sense to you? When we dig in, it doesn't make sense. It's difficult to understand. But that is the revelation of the Lord. And the revelation progress. And even when he began to give prophecy concerning the Messiah. Because the prophecy about the Messiah is that he will send someone. He will send a son. But this son is being worshipped as God. So he is not just an ordinary person. But he is being worshipped as God. 
And this part here is called everlasting father. But what does this mean? Everlasting means without end, perpetual. And father talks about being the source or the architect. So it can be translated as father of eternity. It can be translated as somebody who is from eternity and has no end. But what is the implication of a father? First, the father provides. And second, the father protects. These are the two, the two things that the Messiah did. He provided himself as the sacrifice and he promised protection upon those who belong to him. That's why if you remember in John 17, the prayer of Jesus, my prayer is that you protect them against the evil one. So we know that as his children, we have the protection of God. It's like the devil wants to harm us. There's no question about that. But with the edge of protection and the seal of God, he is powerless. Every time the devil sees you, he sees the seal, which is the Holy Spirit. And he is reminded, this, this person belongs to me. You cannot touch him. However, the problem is, when a Christian decides to venture into sin, then he is opening door for the enemy to interfere in his life. The seal of protection of God is there, but when we entertain sin, we are opening doors for the enemy in our life. And so it has to be both ways. We recognize the protection of the Lord, but we keep the door closed against the enemy. And finally, the Prince of Peace. This is probably the most famous title or name of the Messiah. Peace came from the word Shalom, which talks about spiritual harmony, fullness of life, resulting from our relationship with God. In other words, there can be no Shalom without God. The word Shalom is more than just a simple word peace. It is the greeting of the Hebrew people to one another. When they see each other, their greeting is Shalom. What is our greeting as Chinese? Japan. <laughs> when we see each other, it's always a you them. You know, that's our way of expressing our love. Feeling people. We like to feel people. Okay? So it's not a good morning or a or what or what is Japan. Okay, so don't be surprised if you come across a Chinese and they ask you to eat them. Okay? They're not they're not um, they're not hungry green people. That's how they express their love. By feeding you. So sometimes when you're at the table, you know, it's difficult to, to stop eating because there are always people who want to put food on your plate. So we have different ways of greeting one another, but the word shalom talks about fullness. Nothing is missing, nothing is broken, everything is restored. And it can only come from the Lord. You know, um, there are two aspects of real peace. First, there is that inner peace. And secondly, there is that external peace. If there is external peace without inner peace, that is false peace. Because peace has to begin from inside. The Jews rejected the Messiah because they were expecting him to deliver them from the Roman captivity or occupation. But what was Jesus preaching instead? He was preaching the opposite. He was saying, give to Caesar what is due to Caesar. But the Jews were thinking, let's overthrow the Romans. Jesus told them, when somebody hit you with the right cheek, and most of the time, these are Roman soldiers who strike the Israelites. Jesus said, turn to the other cheek. And whenever the, the Jews were asked, to carry things for Roman soldiers. You know, there's a rule. I think that uh, 
the, the Roman soldiers can just pick and ask any Israelite to carry things for them up to a mile. But Jesus said, when you are asked to go a mile, go an extra mile. Can you imagine what it is, what it is bringing into the mind of the Israelite? The Messiah is supposed to deliver us from the Roman captivity and he is teaching us to obey and submit and do extra things for the Romans. No wonder they rejected Jesus Christ. They failed to understand that before the Messiah can bring external peace, he has to bring inner peace. If the Messiah successfully overthrew the Roman Empire, and did, but did not bring the redemption that is needed in the soul and the spirit of men, nothing would have been accomplished. But the Messiah has to die for us. He has to pay for the, for the sins that we have done so that He can bring peace into our heart and into our life. Peace with God and peace with ourselves. Because sin brings that deep shame and guilt into our lives that we always carry in us. And that deep sense of shame and guilt results to insecurity or pride in our life. That's why the Bible says in the book of Revelation, how did the saints overcome the evil one? They overcame the evil one by the blood of the Lamb and the testimony of their mouth. The blood of the Lamb, the death of Christ, took away the guilt. We're no longer guilty when we receive the salvation from Christ. But shame is something else. Many times we know we have for, forgiven. Many times we know that our past is already past. But there are still there's still hints of shame in our life. Nahuyata, whenever we remember those things. Nahuyata, whenever we recall certain things. And the Bible says, by the word of their testimony, they overcome the evil one. What does it mean? The moment you are able to testify about your past, it means you have been free from the shame of your past. Because you begin to share your story from a different perspective, from God's redemptive perspective. God wants to set us free from shame and guilt. And these are the two things that keeps us from having inner peace within us. Jesus already resolved the guilt part. Have we faced our past and saw it from God's perspective, so that we will also be free from the shame of our past. And so before I end, which of the four names of Christ has the greatest impact on you? For some people, having a wonderful counselor has a deep impact because they, they know that it is very important to have somebody who will guide you in your life. For others, everlasting father have a great impact. Because knowing that God is your father and knowing that Jesus points us to the father reminds us that we are no longer orphans but children of God. For others, it is reminding God because it reminds them that God is all-powerful and that even if we have problems in life, the mighty God is able to help us. And for others, it's the place of peace. Because there's so much things in life that could rob us of our peace and joy. But Jesus is the place of peace. And He's the one who promised that God is able to give peace in our heart beyond human comprehension. And how does the name of the Messiah demonstrate the faithfulness of God in your life? Let's
come for the Lord in prayer. Let's just begin to thank the Lord that in this Christmas season, it's not just about parties, you know, there are a lot of parties going on, and I believe some of us will get that in more than three or four parties. And those parties are part of celebration, there's nothing wrong with that. But maybe that this will also be an opportunity for us to go deep and reflect on who Jesus truly is in our lives. It is one thing to say that we love the Lord. But it's another to have the fear of the Lord in our lives. Peter loved Jesus. But his love for Jesus did not cause him not to, not to deny Jesus in times. But when he understood what the fear of the Lord is, he was ready to lay down his life for Jesus. The love of the Lord and the fear of the Lord has to go together in our Christian life. Where are we in a journey? Lord, this morning, we thank you for reminding us of God. That as Christians, our celebration of Christmas has a deeper meaning. Because it talks about our redemption in you. And we thank you, O oh God. That as we Reflect on your goodness in our life. We are reminded that you are the source of our joy and our peace. And as we grow deeper in our understanding and our relationship with you, we will also grow to appreciate all the more what you have done for us on the cross in the life that you have brought upon us through your death and resurrection. As we continue to worship you, O oh God, may our minds be fixed upon you so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us respond to the word of God. Let us rise. Indeed, Jesus is everything to us. Christ is enough for us. Let's be there and take care of the
him who is able to keep you from falling and to present him before his presence with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, honor, power, and dominion now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.